So I've mentioned this idea of the iceberg model a few times so far, and I think it's a good uh, stage for us to uh, jump in and, and discuss that. You may be familiar with it, uh, may, maybe not. It's quite a popular concept, definitely in system thinking, but even uh, outside that. Um, and it's used to illustrate the different levels um, of a system and uh, to discuss those, represent those. And it's using this analogy of the iceberg because it's saying just like with an iceberg, a large percent of what's going on in our world is hidden from our view. Uh, we see the tip of the iceberg as the, um, as the um, saying goes, we don't see what's going on underneath the water. And uh, most of the ice iceberg is, uh, that's that's where it is. That's where most of what shapes and influences the outcomes in our world um, actually going on kind of behind the scenes. Um, when we go to a new city, we see some buildings, we see some people walking around and so on and so forth. Um, and we see prices and we see things like this, individual bits and pieces, but we don't actually see what's really kind of going on behind the scenes, you know, all the interrelationships there in that city, the, the social networks, the political networks, the information exchanges, um, where all the money's moving around from, from people and organizations and so forth. Um, and we don't actually see kind of the rules uh, encoded in this and the deep mental mental models and structures like that. So that's what we're getting at. We see the tip of the iceberg when we look at systems and that's the immediate outcome. Whereas if we want to really uh, influence them, as we talked about the upstream thing, we need to go down and we need to figure out what's going on underneath um, underneath the waterline there. Go down to the bottom of the iceberg. So um, that's the analogy. This is the way it's structured. Uh, there's four levels to it. Uh, above the water um, is what we see. It's the event, the observable actions and phenomena. Just below the waterline are uh, the patterns that describe trends over time. And uh, below that, we have systemic structures. So these bottom ones are the the ones that lead to systems change, um, that really want to systems, and it's where our leverage points are going to be because uh, it's going upstream. Um, so this is how the parts are interrelated to influence the patterns. Um, so each level above emerges from the one below. Uh, so then if we go below structures, we'll see the mental models uh, that support everything else in the system. So it's saying how people look at that system, how people understand what's going on and the system and what they're trying to achieve and the function of all of this will shape and create the structures uh, through which they organize themselves and out of those structures will get uh, the emergence of patterns over time uh, and within those patterns will be these individual uh, phenomena. So there'll be many examples of this, we'll get some more at the end, but we can think about something like um, housing or different kinds of economic structures um, where people have a mental model around accommodation or what around what housing is, around you know who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it, and um, an understanding of that system and how it works, and that creates certain structures, um, certain institutions, certain patterns of behaviors, certain markets, certain ways of transacting, so on and so forth. And then out of those, we'll get things, um, patterns and trends over time, uh, such as increasing price of, of housing because we've deregulated it, we've changed the rules there, or a housing bubble, right? Because of the way the market's working, people's ultimately their perception of the price and value of, of accommodation, what they think is going to happen in the future will lead to those patterns. And then at the top, we might get, uh, you know, the burst of that bubble, the crash of uh, property prices. We might see, oh, Property prices have just gone down, uh, have just dropped. Um, well, we might see, oh, there's a price of that property and it looks very different to what it was before. And that's part of a trend that's saying, oh, this housing market has just crashed. Uh, and behind that are those structures and those mental models and so forth. If we ever wanted to really address and, and change the way the system works, uh, it wouldn't be just changing that price. It wouldn't just be changing that, trying to change that trend um, specifically and trying to make it go up and down. It'd be changing actually what's going on underneath the hood there in terms of people, uh, these markets and institutional structures and rules of the game, and then the the, the ultimate mental models. So that's the iceberg model helps us think about um, intervening interventions on different levels, um, and that's that. And it's all about seeing system structure, it's the stuff that's going on uh, beneath the waterline there, and will be away uh, from this symptomatic um, response, which is a lot of what we do. And that's what happens at the top of the, the iceberg. Uh, when we respond there to the events, 
we're taking symptomatic approaches and this uh, yeah a lot of what we do but it doesn't lead to any uh, long-term uh, changes uh, so just quickly to run through that iceberg and what, what I meant by the different levels. So this top one is the, the, the events of the waterline. Uh, events are markers in time where multiple variables are observed. So it's what we see now or what we just saw, what happens. Uh, they're individual um, activities. They're specific outcomes from the system. So you might uh, go home this evening and look at the news and see, oh, the... Um, you know, the government of, of Iraq or, or wherever it is um, has just fallen or something like this. There's been an oil spill in the, in the Caribbean and that is an event. And we see that above the waterline. But of course, if I see there's an oil spill in the Caribbean, I see there's a small fall of the uh, Iraqi government. Um, I'm not an expert in either of those systems. I don't actually know what's going on behind that. Uh, I could have you know, some ideas. But it's I'm just seeing above the water, uh, above the water line, right? The event, um, but of course behind that are uh, structures, right? Uh, political structures, social structures, economic structures, um, business models, and so forth. So for each of those levels, there's a way of responding to that level. There's a way of um, if we look at the world in that way and we try to affect change on that level, this is how we'll respond, right? If we look at the world in that, that way, the event level, we're going to react to whatever's happening. We're going to try and stop it or um, change it on that level. We do not shift our thinking in any way. We just act swiftly to fix the immediate problem using pre-existing solutions uh, that have worked in the past. So when there's a financial crisis, the central bank, it just tries to do what it can to try and prevent that financial crisis. It, it takes immediate action to prevent everything falling to pieces. And it's a, it's affecting the system on that level because that's its, its job. But they're not going to change. They're not going to stop the pattern of financial crisis in the world uh, over time by doing that. They're just going to prevent that particular event, that particular, um, that particular outcome by reacting to it which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? They probably do need to do that in that situation. But as mentioned, it's not going to change the system. So below that are the trends uh, and the patterns. Um, this is what's happening over time. It's, um, are things going up? Are they going down? Um, what sort of patterns do we see happening over time? Uh, this might be, uh, you know, reoccurring oil spills. I talked about one of those, but that might just be once and if I was paying attention, I might see actually there's another one uh, just five years ago and one just a couple of years before that, and they seem to be getting more frequent uh, nowadays. So this is a trend. Uh, these are important to identify because they uh, indicate that an event is not an isolated incident. And when we identify patterns, we can start to anticipate them. We can start to um, you know think strategically in terms of how to adapt to them, how to mitigate them so on and so forth. Again, this is a lot of what we do uh, in our management. Um, we try to plan and predict and so forth these, these patterns and anticipate them, you know, take the right actions um, accordingly. And again, it's important, but it's not going to change the uh, system. This is what does change systems, uh, going down here to the bottom of the iceberg. And these are the structures. Structures can be understood as the rules of the game. They can be written or unwritten. They can be physical and visible or invisible. So if we talk about physical, going and visiting a city, well, that city has a structure to it, and you're going to have to pretty much follow it, right? There's streets, and there's uh, an inf transport infrastructure, and you're probably going to end up at some centralized location in that city because of, and not at some other location, right? Because of the structure of that transport system that's already in place. And that's a systemic um, structure, a physical one, but there are many others. Uh, rules of the game, norms, policies, guidelines, power structures, distribution of resources, or informal ways of working that have been tacitly or explicitly institutionalized. Um, information flows is another good example. Right? Who's connected to who and how does information travel um, in this system is a structure that has a huge influence. And it influences the patterns and outcomes over time. 
So when we understand those structures, right? Like when we understand the structure of this city, uh, when we understand uh, the structure of how information is flowing in this organization, our response then can actually be one that's more about design, redesigning uh, that those structures so they work more effectively, right? Instead of everything, uh, you know, in the transport, if we had, uh, you know, a centralized node there, a centralized um, position where a lot of routes are going into that uh, in the structure, we might get you know traffic counts and might get congestion there so we could try and redesign that and uh distribute it by creating uh, different nodes and different connections in that system so that things would start flowing and new weights and would get the emergence and new outcome wouldn't get such um high peak 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 rush hour at certain times and you know traffic jams and so forth in this node there'd be more distributed and so forth the resources would be flowing in new ways because we redesigned that system uh and that's getting to systemic structures and how you respond there. Um, but it's not just physical structures, it's also information, it's also rules um, and so forth. So then finally, uh, we have uh, the mental models, which are the ways people uh, perceive and understand uh, the system and its goals and what they're doing. Uh, and this goes all the way down to uh, more fundamental things around beliefs, attitudes, morals, values, culture, you know, what's really at the bottom of why people do things and why they don't do things and what shapes our understanding of the world and uh, and so forth. Um, so mental models are ultimately what keeps the structure doing what it does. And uh, this is the place of highest leverage, right? If we change this, um, you can really transform a system. Um, we can think about it in our own lives when we change our way of thinking about uh, for example, our body or our health or whatever it is, uh, when we start to say, oh, I want to be a healthy person, I want to, you know, start living a healthy life, that's kind of a mental model. And if we adopt that and actually operationalize it, put new structures and patterns into our behavior, into our life, then we know that over time we can get kind of uh, big changes happening in our life um, and our, our, our way of being and so forth. Uh, so that's a mental model. Um, and change those and you will get uh, transfer, transformative uh, change. It can re reshape the structure of the system and overcome even the greatest challenges. That's the iceberg model. Uh, many examples I've given a few already, but this is uh, just a quick one. Uh, if we're talking about uh, one, one's health here, um, on the event level, we might be catching a cold, uh, would be an event, there might be a pattern where we're often catching uh, colds uh, when we're tired. And then behind that's the structure. Um, we're getting tired might include a uh, lack of rest from excessive work. And behind that is maybe a mental model of us um, thinking of ourselves as a hard working person, so we spend a lot of time working, uh, which leads to the pattern of uh, getting sick and uh, yeah, those, those events uh, along the way. That's the iceberg model. Um, it's just healthy as brain uh, where we're going to intervene and the level of uh, leverage uh, in that system. We can see in this example, if we try to just uh, prevent the immediate um, event, right, you take some drugs or whatever it is to get rid of the cold, not going to change much. We're going to get a cold again in the future. Um, so then we have to go all the way to the right. We have to actually change our way of thinking about um, kind of who we are and our relationship to work, if we really wanted to change that pattern uh, and that system uh, of behavior, should we say. Uh, 